Good morning everyone and happy Tuesday. Today is just one day, which in the United States is a day that all the charities, animal charities got together and decided that today is the day that no animals get put down in any kill shelters in the United States, which is really amazing. And I wish that they did that in Canada too, although I don't know if we have any kill shelters. Um, but no animals get put down today. Good morning, Monica. And it's really, really amazing because the amount of animals that get put down every year is absolutely devastating. And I have a bunch of statistics for you, but there hasn't been a new big release of statistics since 2015. So these are the most recent ones that I could find. But basically, the price to adopt animals also goes down a lot to help um, get animals adopted so they can bring and rescue more animals, which is amazing, amazing. And um, there are approximately 2.7 million animals put down every year in shelters, 1.3 million dogs, most of which are um, seniors, bully breeds, or black dogs and 1.4 million cats. Canada has no kill shelters, there we go. Um, and the US sends death row cases up here because then they know that they won't get put down and they're more likely to get adopted. Three million a year in the US that are on the death row get put down and the um, ASPCA admitted that 80% of the animals on death row that get put down are either their medical condition is treatable or they're actually actually adoptable. So 80% of the cases that get put down of that 3 million could have had homes, but because of the overpopulation of dogs and cats, the people who rescue them, there's just an infinite number more on the streets that need to be rescued. It is horrifying, Monica, when you think about it. And if, I've, if you've seen some of the um, animal agriculture documentaries, they actually show some of the wire crates that the dogs get put in. And I had to stop watching because it just broke my heart. But Canada also brings in a lot of international cases. Um, I know the SPCA in Puerto Vallarta, which is in Mexico, their SPCA sends a lot of their dogs up here and they get adopted up here, which is really amazing. But we have so many homeless animals here as well that I feel like we need to work on that situation by regulating or standardizing spay neutering or sterilizing. Sterilizing is becoming more popular. Basically, it means you don't take the full sex organ out. You just take out the reproductive part, meaning the eggs or the sperm creating part of the genitals but it makes it easier on the animal there's less hormonal deficiencies and it doesn't you're not fully taking an organ out of their body basically for females especially outside of the euthanasia rates in dogs this again is 2015 um the euthanasia rate went from 30 percent to 13 percent which is quite impressive. Over the last 20 years, that's a um, pretty significant amount, I would say. But there's also way more animals than there used to be. So when you think about the rate, there's actually more animals being put down, but less percentage of them because more are getting adopted because there's just so many animals out there. The adoption rate has gone up from 39% to 50%, which is at least halfway, but when you think of what it means if they don't get adopted, 50% doesn't really seem like a lot. In the reclaims, meaning the animal got lost or somebody surrendered them to the shelter, they went back and got them. Went, went up from 24% to 31, which again is not that much, but Many pets who get lost, people don't know how to find them, or if they're not microchipped, then it's hard to 
um, scan them and say, oh, this is the owner's information, let's just call them and they can come and get their animal. Because microchipping is really, really important. June is actually National Microchip Your Pet Month. And if you haven't done it, even if you get the um, your tattoo instead, microchips can move. And Kai got hers done when she got spayed. But not all shelters have the same microchip scanner. And there are different types of microchips. So some microchip scanners don't pick up certain microchips. And if they migrate, they don't actually know where to scan. They'd have to scan the entire body. And often cases, if the shelter's really busy or there's a lot of animals there, they may not check the whole body to make sure. Which also makes me sad because the whole point of microchipping is that you know that if your pet gets lost and returned to a shelter, that they will call you and tell you, we scanned this microchip and it had your contact information in it. So it's really, really important that if you do decide to get a microchip, you have to register it and keep that information in a file with your pet's name on it because if they call you and say we've got a microchip here can you usually to make sure that you're the right owner they will read you the number on the microchip or ask you information about that animal so it's always nice to make sure that you have that for cats the euthanasia rate has dropped immensely which makes me really happy uh, 20 years ago, it used to be 60% of cats in shelters used to get put down, and now it's 21% as of 2015. I'm hoping these numbers have gone down more, meaning there's less cases of euthanasia, more people keeping track of their animals, less escapees and lost pets, but again, one can only hope. The adoption rate has also gone up from 28% to 61, which is amazing. It seems like a lot of people are interested in cats, which is fabulous. And it just, to see, I know how hard the shelter people work because for a lot of my birthdays as a kid, I would just wanted to go to the SPCA and look at the animals. But it's really amazing when you see all the animals get adopted and then you can rescue a new batch of animals and then help those get adopted. And it's just a never ending cycle. But when you have to watch the sad stories play out, the animal stays for a really long time and doesn't get adopted, it just breaks your heart. So I actually watched a video yesterday of this little, I think he started when he was four and he basically goes to shelters in the United States and films himself with the dogs that don't get adopted and usually they're pit bull mixes or bigger dogs or bulldogs of some kind and he just films himself playing with them. And talks about how great they are and how they need to be adopted and almost all of them get adopted there's been a couple cases where they got put down anyway but i'd say like 90 percent of the time that animal gets adopted after being in one of these kids videos and he's now 10 and they made a documentary about him or a episode on uh, animal planet so really cute you should go check that out um in terms of the rate of animals that go in a shelter and never come out, one in eight dogs go in a shelter. And again, these stats are from 2015. Hopefully it's less by now, like maybe one in 20. Um, and one in five cats. So cats, once they get into the shelter, they have less chance of making it out. But the adoption rate is actually quite high, which is nice to see. But again, most of the... Cats are not friendly towards people, and the dogs are not friendly towards people, depending on how they've been rescued. So keep that in mind. But it's really sad because once they go in the shelter, they never come out, so they never get to have a home, and they never get to, you know, be inside someone's house and feel grass and have a collar and their own toys and things like that. Um, so if you want to help, the animals in the shelters, besides obviously adopting one of them or working at the shelter, there are a couple of things you can do. You can advocate for adopting animals over uh, buying them. And essentially you can share stories of animals that get adopted and just share their stories. People really like to read that kind of stuff or do a short video about um, how they're adjusting to their new life or before and after type thing. You can educate people 
on um, identification methods, so things like microchips and dog tags and making sure that everybody takes care of their identification. So if your pet does get lost, then you have a higher chance of it being, he or she, not it, being returned to you because these animals are part of our families. And if you lose one, and I've actually, when I was younger, one of my friend's dogs ran away and she lived around the corner. So I got on my bike and I went over and we looked for hours and hours trying to find her dog. And it turns out he had burrowed under the fence to the neighbor's yard and was hiding behind the shed for five hours. But we did find him, thank goodness. But just things like making sure your neighbors know what your what your pet looks like and their name and make sure they're friendly with all of them because in any case, if they see your animal running around, it's good for them to have someone that they know to go to just in case. Three, the shelters can streamline the adopting process. A lot of them, um, for example, the uh, Toronto Humane Society has a pretty extensive adoption process, which is good because it means that the um, return rate on the pets, meaning they take them home and decide, oh, sorry, my kid's allergic to this, or this dog doesn't get along with my cat, and they return them. Um, it means that there's less of that, but the adoption process is very um, rigorous. You have to fill out a questionnaire and make sure that you're matched with the personality of the animal you want to adopt. You have to go for a meet and greet in Toronto, and then you have, if you have any um, kids or other pets, then they have to meet the animal beforehand and they do a home inspection to make sure you're meeting the basic standards. Most um, shelters will not let you adopt a dog unless you have um, an enclosed property, meaning your backyard is fenced and ours is actually not. It's fenced on one side and there's a hedge on one side, but the other two sides are not. So if I ever wanted to adopt a dog from the Toronto Humane Society, but I have to get the rest of the backyard fenced first because they want to make sure that they won't run away. But something like that, um, I know they work really hard at it and it's important that the animals are matched to people who can take care of them because a lot of people, especially after I got Kaya, they said, oh wow, your dog's really pretty, I want to get one. And I'm like, well, where do you live? And they go, in an apartment. And I work nine to five every day. So I don't think having an animal that needs three hours of exercise a day and is very, very intelligent, it gets bored easily, would do well by themselves in, an, in a small apartment for, you know, eight, nine hours a day and ended up talking them down into maybe a cat or a smaller um, pet because ultimately it's about the quality of life for the animal. And if you can't give them that, you have to be willing to admit that and pick something more suited to your lifestyle. I do have an ebook about that. It's called So You Want a Dog. It's on the shop. I think I have it for $10. Um, basically, everything you need to know if you're thinking about getting a pet, how to pick one that is appropriate for your lifestyle, and what you need to know while they're growing. So at certain periods of their life, certain things are more important, like socialization, um, sensitivity to teething, making sure they grow through that process, and it's really, really helpful. I've been told it's um, quite extensive for what it is. Um, so go check that out if you like. Monica says, I'm looking at adopting another bully breed. He's three. He's a typical bully breed stubborn, so people haven't been able to deal with him. Yes. For bully breeds, I know I've talked about this before, but if you are an experienced pet parent with them, by all means, go for it. But a lot of people see a pit bull or something like that and they've never had a, never had an animal before and they're like yeah I want to get a pit bull great and then they have no idea how to handle them they have no idea about how to deal with them in public they have no idea about how to train them whatsoever and they're probably not the best first choice for a pet but Monica I know you've had quite a few dogs before he's three yeah definitely I think I think you would you would make that dog a very lovely home and I'm sure Willow would like having a brother for sure. Someday I'm going to get Kaya a brother but until the backyard is fenced and she's maybe a little bit older she's not so good at sharing attention so we're working on that but I think she'll like the idea. 
of having a brother. And the last Willow, aw, Willow and Wally. That's so cute. Have to send me a picture if you end up getting them of both of them together. Oh, Willow and Wally. Okay. Um, the last step that shelters, a lot of shelters and vets actually have um, discounted spay or neuter days, meaning for that month it's a lot cheaper. A lot of um, vets and rescue organizations volunteer their time to spay and neuter stray animals to decrease the need for, or I guess the necessity for the shelter because there's more and more homeless animals. It is the responsible thing to do, but there's a lot of uh, conversation back and forth about how to know when it's the right time to spay and neuter. And I have done another video on this with a lot more information. It's on my YouTube channel. It's just Birch Animal Wellness. All my pages have the same name to make it easy but do go check that out. Sterilization isn't popular yet in Canada. It's more available in the United States, but it is slowly coming up here. Maybe in like 15 years, it'll be more standard, but just to decrease the amount of animals that need homes. Thank you for tuning in. Next week, what am I talking about next week? I just did the research for it and I already forget. Ah, okay. By popular request, I think Monica, this was your request. Um, life stage nutrition for mostly for puppies, kittens going into and then being weaned. There's also um, pregnant females, how their nutrition changes, and then senior pets, how their nutrition is different from when they're an adult, when to start kind of looking for that switch, and then talking about teeth because a lot of people don't know when puppy teeth come in, when to start changing the um, durability of their toys, when to change to soft food, hard food, that kind of thing. But thank you for tuning in. Have a fabulous rest of your Tuesday. Maybe it'll be actually sunny today. And um, I will see you next Tuesday. Bye, Monica. Bye, Huda. Bye, Catherine.